Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and thank you for your patience. I cannot tell you what a joy it is to see you all sitting um, on this beautiful pavilion, having worked with Sue Fujimoto and his team on realising it since November last year. Sue was born in Haikido in 1971 uh, and is widely acknowledged as being one of the most important ar architects coming to prominence worldwide. After studying architecture at the Department of Architecture in the Faculty of Engineering at Tokyo University, he established Sue Fujimoto Architects in, in 2000. In 2012, he was awarded the Golden Lion for National Participation at the Venice Architecture Biennale, along with Kumiko Inui, Akisha Hirata, and Noya Hatayama. He has completed a majority of his buildings in Japan, with commissions ranging from the domestic, such as Final Wooden House, House N, or House NA, to the institutional, such as Musashino Art University Library at Tokyo University. Following on from his first built work, an occupational therapy building for Sedai Hospital, he has produced a number of designs for healthcare institutions, including the Children's Psychiatric Rehabilitation Centre in Hokkaido. As truly I said, it's an incredible excitement. Uh, this is the very first event um, which happens uh, in, uh, in this pavilion. It's our dream come true to be here with yeah. Fujimoto in his uh, structure and for the first time have a new generation of architects actually design the Southern Line Pavilion. Sue is one of the key protagonists of that new generation. His work has always resisted categorization. He's resisted separation, separation of private interior from public exterior spaces. And he's constantly questioned, actually, such separations by interlocking his light wave and also very flexible designs. And uh, very often, uh, his designs are actually triggers for social interactions. They're triggers for new behaviors. Or as Tino Segal would say, they are triggers for very important new 21st century rituals. Um, the Serpentine uh, Pavilion Commission was invented by Julia Peyton Johns in 2000 with uh, Zaha Hadid. Uh, the idea is that each pavilion is sited on the gallery's lawn for three months. And uh, the immediacy of the commission is kind of important because the architect has a maximum of six months actually from the invitation to the completion. So there is a great sense of urgency uh, implicit in this, in this project. It attracts up to 300,000 visitors annually which often is more visitors actually than the Venice uh, architecture uh, biennale. It really is, if Gilbert and George say, art for all, this is architecture for all. It's free admission, it's also for flaneurs in the park, people who come to see it, but also people who discover it by chance. Past pavilions have included designs by Herzog de Meron and Ai Weiwei in 2012, by Peter Zumto in 2011, Jean Nouvel in 2010, Katsuo Sejima and Rio Nishizawa of Sana in 2009, Frank Gehry in 2008, where we had Sue Fujimoto yeah. here giving an amazing lecture in the Frank Gehry Pavilion, a wooden pavilion, uh, and Sue presented his wooden housing. I'll talk about that later. Yeah. Olafur Eliasson and Katie Tars in 2007, Rem Kohlhaas and Cecil Barmond with Arup in 2006, Alvaro Siza and Eduardo Suto de Mura with Cecil Barmond and Arup in 2005, MVRDV with Arup and Andrea's project in 2004, Oscar Niemeyer in 2003, Toyo Ito and Cecil Barmond with Arup in 2002, Daniel Liebeskin with Arup in 2001, and as already mentioned, Zaha Hadid in 2000. The project is very much conceived as a curatorial one. In other words, we don't have a competition to select the architect. We decided, as part of the programming team, Hans Ulrich, Jochen Volz, and myself. Uh, and it also is, we work with architects in the same way we do work with our artists, which is we ask them to press the boundaries of their their architectural language, and we engage in this very, very intense process that really Sue knows all too well, um, that begins uh, with a six-month lead time. Uh, the, we invite the architect before Christmas, uh, we meet before Christmas, and then begin to work in earnest in January. By February, we have already submitted to planning, and these projects require planning permission in just the same way as any permanent structure, with um, all the necessary permissions from our local authority. So as the years progress, so do the requirements of what, and indeed limitations, of what architects can do. This is a collaborative project. 
And unlike also permanent buildings, and we know this from working with Zaha Hadid, who's designing the Serpentine Sackler Gallery, there is nothing ever more than a handshake as a commitment to engage with this process. And it is, of course, an enormous thanks to Sue and to Nadine and your team for the extraordinary work they've done, which I can tell you has nothing, has been nothing other than hugely engaging from our first um, conversations on the telephone to the visits to Tokyo and to having you in London for the installation. It has been really a pure pleasure. And um, we, as part of this project, the use of it is absolutely key. We have the cafe, which is here every day, but also the Park Nights programme, uh, supported by COS, is an essential part of the programmes that take place here. And uh, we're very grateful to the Annenberg Foundation for their ongoing support. As I mentioned, the park night, so that's going to be always on Friday, so we hope you can all come back. They're going to be, you know, composer, Yasuna Ottoni, who are going to play the building like a musical instrument. There are going to be lectures, readings, film streams, and culminates then in October in the 89 plus uh, marathon. The pavilion was made possible through the sponsorship of HP and the support of Hiscox. We're very deeply grateful uh, to them. The structural engineering expertise of ACOM, and especially to be mentioned here, uh, is a wonderful David Glover, was essential. The Pavilion program has been supported by RISE, by Via Bizzuno, by Val Gotchal Amandres. So many, many thanks to them. We are also grateful for the in-kind sponsorship, and that's a very important part to actually produce the reality of this Pavilion, that there is a lot of in-kind sponsorship. Stage one. XXL, Glass, Saint-Gobain, EP9, EC Harris, Sabic, and also SCS. And of course, also for the additional support, we are very, very grateful to the Japan Foundation, to ANA, to the Japan Society, and also to the Great Britain Sasakawa Foundation. As always, the Serpentine Gallery is immensely indebted to our long-standing supporters, the Arts Council England, the City of Westminster, as well as also the Royal Parks. The Independent is our media partner. We are very grateful to them for their ongoing collaboration with the Serpentine in addition to Wallpaper. Last but not least, we'd like to extend our thanks to Fortnum and Mason for the provision of actually the delicious food and drink here in the Pavilion Cafe. And I would also like to welcome very specially Niklas Mark, who is here, who is the author of the catalogue um, of uh, uh, Sue's Pavilion, which will come out soon. Thank you. So now we get to the meat of the whole proceedings. And Sue, what is so important about this, it's your voice that we want to hear, not ours. So we will be prompting you with a series of questions. Um, and we've been through this process on a number of occasions, uh, and it's always been fascinating for us. So I hope it will be equally fascinating to all of you. Uh, we will stop before the end to allow you to answer questions. Uh, sorry, not answer questions, ask questions. So please formulate them in your mind and, um, and indeed prompt us along the way if there's anything obvious that you think we're missing. So we've talked a little bit about the pavilion and how it yeah. came into being. Mm -hmm. um, we've talked about the time scale, which is yeah. very tight. Yeah. What we haven't talked about is your first visit to the certain time, where yeah. we omitted to say that we wanted to invite you to design the pavilion, yeah. and the whole meeting took place with rather cross purposes until the final moment. Mm -hmm. What was your invitation, what was your initial response to being, to being invited to design the pavilion? And could you talk about the design process mm -hmm. and the number of the, the conversations and also the, the earlier schemes that yeah. were not realized? Yeah. Okay, fine. Uh, good, evening. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Sir Fujimoto. And I'm very sorry, the pavilion is too bright, so it's <laughs> just a black panel. But uh, it is showing something. Uh, a bit uh, like an image. But they can't, my head's in the way. So they can't, <laughs> okay. Can't see anyway, the, I came here last November to visit Julia and Hans uh, to talk about the first uh, brief of this pavilion. And it was November, so it was not this shiny day. It's a bit uh, cloudy and uh, the green leaves are falling down, so most of the trees are just a uh, the trees. But, uh, and of course, I knew very well about the series of this uh, pavilion series. So I was so excited about the 
invitations, but at the same time, it's a big pressure. And uh, I didn't have any idea when I came to here the first time. And I talked with Julia, and uh, yeah, they explain. You explain about the brief uh, functions or the rough schedule, something like that. And uh, yes, as Hans explained, I came here for the Frangiri one, and after that, I came for the Janovel one, 2010, just to visit and walk around. So I knew very well about the beautiful surroundings, beautiful greens, and I saw many, many pictures. For example, the Sana one is featuring the beautiful greens surroundings, or uh, the last year, of course, the Heltok one. So the first inspiration was this beautiful surroundings. I try to create something uh, nicely matching or vanishing in the background, but at the same time, it's still existing uh, in this park. It's a kind of an ambiguous uh, feelings, vanishing, but at the same time, outstanding. And I didn't have any idea about these structures, but just such, a, such inspirations. And on the other hand, I was thinking about the, like a landscape, because I understand this place for the summertime it's a place for people to behave, to sit on or to lie on, like drinking coffee or just reading books. So various different activities I uh, was imagining. So try to create some nice landscape-like areas to allow people to behave uh, as they like, various different ways. So that was the first inspiration. And then, of course, we have to translate such a rather conceptual things to the form of architecture. And it was a tough, tough work. And the whole December, I came here at the end of November, so the whole period of December, we made many sketches and, uh, sorry, it's almost black. <laughs> we made many, many sketches. You could see in the end of this month, in a catalog, some of the sketches and the, the early models. But we made many more models and sketches and sent some of them to Julia Hans and then to get the really uh, exciting feedback. <laughs> I mean, uh, kind of tough, tough discussions about that. Because in that period, we did just only through the phone conference or Skype meetings. So it's a bit difficult to. Uh, to show clearly what it is or something. And our ideas is not yet uh, matured in that period. But then, gradually, such kind of a landscaping ideas and the transparent, translucent ideas, we try to get something. Finally, I got an idea of this grid. And it enables me, us, to make the artificial landscape, but at the same time, kind of a nice gradation, gradation of the, the transparency, translucency to enable us, from, even from inside, to enjoy the green surroundings and the different densities. So some, some area really cozy, surrounded feeling, some area really open, too open sometimes. <laughs> Such kind of a uh, key concept of the grids came to us. And then that's the, almost the end of December. And we explain about that, sending them some images. But the image, the rough, mo yeah, as you can imagine, it's, almost impossible to make a, a small model of this pavilion because this grid is small, thin, so if you like to make a model, it's almost like a, something different. We send them to Julia Hans, but uh, no, this is not, not the thing <laughs> you said. <laughs> it's not acceptable, <laughs> something like that. But I, I tried to explain, but finally Julia says, okay, I'm going to Japan, Tokyo. <laughs> the New Year's Day is the 2nd of January. And uh, I have to explain that the 2nd of January for Japanese people, it's a kind of a big holiday. <laughs> so, but anyway, it's a uh, precious, uh, <laughs> precious things that uh, the director of the Serpentine <laughs> Gallery come to Tokyo directly. <laughs> so, okay. So the whole, the end of the year and the New Year day, we work. No holiday. <laughs> <laughs> to prepare everything, models and something. And uh, finally, we, we met in the studio, Tokyo. And then, of course, face-to-face -face discussion is really, really special. And we show the model uh, we made throughout the whole eve of the year and the new year day. It was a nice model. 
and then face-to-face -face discussion conversation about the background and I talk about uh, how I get uh, such an inspiration and uh, how my whole career are relating to the relationship nature and architecture and uh, how the Tokyo urban situation is quite important, such kind of uh, background stories together. And then Julia, of course, quickly understand what it is. And okay, this is it. We, talk to, we have to talk to London as soon as possible. And then we did uh, Skype meetings. Julia here in Tokyo and the London team in London in the conversations. And we, that's the moment we share the first concept. But of course, it should be followed by the really tough works for the realization. And uh, of course, these kind of uh, really engineering things and uh, really difficult construction things should be done in parallel you know, with the design. So we had a big team of ACOM and the stage one the contractors and the serpentine peoples and the rights people. And we had the, of course, Julia stayed on only two, three nights, only three, two nights. Yeah, so quick coming back. But after Julia leaving, we continue such a Skype meetings almost every day. And then I came back. <laughs> <laughs> yes, finally, two weeks later, you came back. <laughs> but it's also interesting. I mean, first of all, we must have seen the first time we yeah. actually did really an East design over Christmas. It seems to be implicit in that timing, but very often yeah. coming on the Christmas holiday oh, yeah. uh, because of that deadline, you know, in January. But what is kind of interesting also is you're sitting all in a sort of a almost mini amphitheater situation here and at the very beginning yeah, there was exactly. this amphitheater oh, yeah. idea yeah. but then it sort of became I remember that you I found notes that you actually said mm -hmm. that you were more interested in this multi-directional aspect uh -huh. in fact the amphitheater is oh, yeah. too one-directional you oh, wanted yeah. it to be much more multi-directional you mm -hmm. wanted it to be protected and also exposed you thought yeah. of a ring mm -hmm. and then more and more <laughs> the ring went to the yeah. grid maybe it's interesting to talk a little bit more about that uh -huh. because that was a yeah. major shift okay know? yeah yeah Yes, during the, the December process, yeah, of course, we made a phone call discussion. And uh, one day, yeah, Hans was talking about the amphitheater, the possibilities of, of course, not the classical amphitheater, but the new definition, I understand, of the amphitheater. And I understand it is uh, the new way for people to come together, to share the space, not only the central point of view, but the more multi direction or new definition of the amphitheater. So we try to start from the, such an amphitheater. And for me, the landscape and the amphitheater is nicely connected together because the amphitheater is, yeah, anciently, it is a kind of a natural landscape. So we started from the amphitheater. But the, the first sketch or first model I sent to them is too, amphi too much amphitheater. Too <laughs> so they get angry, wow, this is just an amphitheater. <laughs> <laughs> it's not, not a new amphitheater, it's too, just an amphitheater. <laughs> and of course, I explained, this is a starting point, so <laughs> please calm down. <laughs> and then we try to redefine the, the amphitheater, more multi multi directions, multi yeah something yeah actually something like this. I understand people sitting behind is uh, yeah don't see. care about us. It's, <laughs> it's nice. Yeah here inside we really focusing lecture but the other side people are enjoying in a different way. Such kind of a multi directional um, theater try to yeah getting growing growing to such a things. And then the ideas of the the various different landscaping ideas and the amphitheater ideas is coming together. But uh, still, just an amphitheater is, is kind of an open air, no roof. Then the Julia gets angry, wow, this is a, no roof. <laughs> you have to have a roof. <laughs> but what, what's, so, what's so interesting, and really, ladies and gentlemen, this is the unvarnished truth, <laughs> um, is that um, in the early, the early proposals, in the early discussions, um, and this difficult sort of Skyping telephone mm -hmm. thing, the genesis of those two projects that you put on the table, one being an amphitheater and the other what we used to uh, colloquially refer to as a sugar cube proposal, mm -hmm. oh, yeah. um, both of them are evident in this pavilion. Because the grid, of course, mm -hmm. is a really a development of the sugar cube, if yeah. I may say so. Yeah. And then the amphitheater, here you all are, in an amphitheater. Mm. So it's interesting that those early discussions um, actually are still here, are still present in this structure. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. And of course, the, this, this structure um, particularly relates to a number of your, your, your mm -hmm. previous schemes. Oh, so yeah. there is, 
a fantastic umbilical cord that threads mm -hmm. its way around yeah. your work, which is after oh, yeah. all part of the brief. Yeah, yeah. To press your architectural <laughs> language. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Finally, yeah. Sugar cube is the uh, the idea is the uh, kind of uh, about two meter or two point five meter cube with it's kind of a tree pot, huge tree pot, and uh, floating above to to cover to shelter the areas. So it is a uh, yeah again it is a landscape different definition of the landscape floating landscape floating forest and uh, yeah I think uh, of course it is inspired by the beautiful trees in this Kensington Garden so yeah that is another uh, one another idea and then the amphitheater landscape idea and um, but I found it's too too crazy to put uh, some roof on the tree pot. <laughs> yeah, indeed. <laughs> yeah. And it's, maybe it could spoil the, con the concept. Mm. So try to integrate in a different way. So keeping the ideas of the landscaping, but the, and the geometry of the cubes, the transforming the cubes in a different scales, and then meshing together the two ideas. The, the gradually, the idea is growing. So the whole crazy idea is not ju just a way of wasting time, but uh, gradually one idea uh, transformed into another or combined together or spread. Gradually, yeah. But it, it was really tough. tough but time. also fascinating. <laughs> it was tough and fascinating because, yeah. as you say, nothing was lost on the way. You know, it all yeah. somehow entered layers and layers, and then mm -hmm. one day the cloud oh, yeah. and the picture and maybe yeah. that would be interesting also at the beginning of this conversation to talk mm -hmm. a little bit about because I remember that one day mm -hmm. uh, we then started to refer to it as a cloud yeah. you know the sugar cube mm -hmm. was no longer the image we used it was yeah. a cloud and obviously cloud is so fascinating because the cloud is obviously the digital age it's mm -hmm. a computer cloud the cloud is also art history I mean Uwe yeah. Damisch wrote this wonderful book in 72 mm -hmm. I was looking at this again this morning which is so incredible where yeah. he describes the art history of the cloud the yeah. cloud is the most fleeting of all masterpieces in the history of painting, where the, it always escapes, it vanishes within the graphic system mm -hmm. to be then rediscovered. Um, so uh, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit how this sort of epiphany of the or this idea of the cloud entered. Oh well, yeah, uh, cloud idea is uh, yeah during the process of the yes the sugar cube is like a floating cloud with trees yeah and amphitheater we try to transform more multi direction. It is like a strange shape of the ring. And it's getting like a cloud. But finally, when I get the ideas of these grids, then it is more like an ambiguous areas with the different densities. And it is a, like a pure space by space, space made by space. Of course, made by steel structures, but almost made by space or made by cloud. And then, of course, I understand the cloud could have a really contemporary meanings of the digital cloud things but at the same time it is really natural shape formless form but at the same time it should be made by really strong uh, strict forms you know, so it's cloud made by steel a rigid grid structure so nice uh, nice contradiction or nice integrations of the opposite things coming together so gradually it's getting the uh, very important meanings for me because yeah at the beginning which I try to create a nice contrast of the nature and architecture. It is, of course, it was, has been a continuous uh, mainstream of my architecture, but here, beautiful nature. So could have a nice uh, integration of nature and architecture, but the cloud, steel cloud, or a really grid cloud could enable us such a beautiful integrations and could provide such a nice landscape, like, or a cloudscape, <laughs> where people can sit on uh, we're walking up such a three-dimensional landscape. So gradually, the meanings of the cloud. Yeah, the beginning it looks like a cloud. It's fine, but the meanings of the cloud is make this project a rich and rich. I think. I mean, what's so what's so interesting is of course a cloud is a is something that really has no shape. It mm -hmm. hovers. Yeah. It 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 um it usually indicates some kind of height and also mm -hmm. a perspective. Yeah. Were, which indeed exists in this in this structure and always in the models, the there was a, a, a very strong statement mm -hmm. about no profile, no mm -hmm. form, no yeah. edge. Yeah. Really, is the point. Mm -hmm. um, and yet the grid is a very the grid and the twenty millimeter yeah. probe, which is a subject of much discussion in Tokyo yeah. about whether they should be fifteen or whether they should be twenty, and. Um, 
and that, uh, amongst many other discussions, these were all uh, yeah. unbelievably interesting yeah. conversations with a very real purpose at the end. Yeah. But the the introduction of the grid mm -hmm. and the counterpoint to the cloud yeah. is a really fascinating one. Mm -hmm. So could you could you just talk a little bit more about that? Wow, it's a of course the grid idea is coming from the more practical reason, I think, just a sitting area, something at the beginning, I think. But at the same time, I was thinking about the landscape, cloud, like a solid object, opaque object. But uh, one day I was thinking about from the street, if you make something really opaque or something really solid, uh, we couldn't see the serpentine building, beautiful buildings. They should be more transparent. And of course, from inside, beautiful trees should be more visible. So transforming the solid things to the more transparent it's a you just like a meshing then solid object transforming to the more transparent so that's the first idea just a kind of a simple idea then i was thinking about the meanings of the grid people can sit on or different densities of the shadow is created and it's getting more like a cloud and sometimes the free form shapes could be could have a nice contrast with the grids. So it is getting nicer ideas for me. And uh, yeah, but uh, yeah, at the same time, the grid is a quite strong form in a sense. And uh, it's kind of a, one of the really old form for architecture. You put the columns and the beams and then you can make a grid. But if you change the size of the scales of the grid in a smaller size, then the meaning is, is completely different. Such a big transformation is fascinating for me. So using the, such a classical form, strong form of architecture, but the, then finally could find, could get the form, less form, or different kinds of forms appearing. That's the contrast uh, was very, very fascinating for me. But I remember, yeah, of course in Tokyo, we talk about such a formless form, but Finally, you, Julia, you, where's the form? <laughs> and then, yeah, this is a grid, it's a simplicity, the form. And the, the whole shape is uh, formless. Yes. But we have to have a form. <laughs> I remember, I remember <laughs> the conversation incredibly oh, yeah. well. And we also, um, we recorded it yeah. on a number of occasions. Oh, yeah. yeah. And I mean, one of the flavors that I want to, to give you, because having had the great privilege of being there, is that Sue, it's true to say, Sue, that I think you're the most un technical in some ways mm -hmm. architect. Yeah. So, ringing London, um, if there were three people on the call, they were taking three different telephones mm -hmm. in your office. Yeah. And there was a feeling of the handmade uh -huh. about everything, yeah. not about the computer. The computers were there, of course, but, but the image was a very, and the reality was a very different one. Mm -hmm. That when you made a model, it was with balsa wood and glue, right. and this is this is a kind of completely diff different ethos, um, and something that is a decision quite mm -hmm. clearly. Yeah. So, what is it that keeps you very mm -hmm. much with the sense of the hand and the materials? Oh, yeah. yeah, actually, it's a really, really important point. Yeah, for our architectural design process, of course, we are using the computer, and uh, finally, the whole things are. In computer 3D model, but uh, at the beginning, because we handle the, this size, really small size model, physical model, and sometimes I myself is using the papers to twisting and then the staple it and something or glue it to find out what is the such a landscape which allow people to to make to to behave as they like or what which kind of a shapes could make nice shaded area in some point and make nice access for such kind of a things thing was done by by hand because it's really complicated to think about that but then gradually hands could lead me to understand what it is or what is happening and gradually gradually that kind of a formless forms is understandable for, for me and then the idea came, the great idea came, and it enables us to transform such a strange shapes to get it into computer, because computer can use such a grid shapes. So we started, par in parallel, we started to do it in computer, but computer model is, at the beginning, it's really rough, 
So it's not so uh, not like a cloud. It's more like a like an object, a strange object. But gradually we uh, kind of uh, adjust the shapes, and then in some point we print out all the plan. We can make a layout, all the plan in paper, and make a, another physical model, more uh, relating to the computer model. So computer and the physical models in parallel to understand what it is. <laughs> because at that time, I didn't know what it is. <laughs> and gradually, we can make such a, a progress. But finally, we made the 1 to 10 model. It's a kind of a 2.5 meter, and the, the height is something like this. It's made by a 2 millimeter thin uh, wooden bar grew together in you know, thousands of points because that decision is quite necessary to make it because of course computer has a model and we could easily choose the viewpoint but in every viewpoint it's almost impossible to understand what it is so physical real model to see the scales and to see the space is quite quite necessary finally we made it we decided to make it and then at the first time I understand what I am doing. <laughs> but after making the model, I, like, a, like a bonsai in Japanese, <laughs> the small tree pot, I cut some of the frame, or I add something to make it more mysterious, in a sense. Because I like to make it like a, not like a simple object, but more unexpected, full of expectations, where what is happening when you make a one step forward or one step on side, then the whole impression is changing. So I, that one to 10 model is big enough for me to push my head inside <laughs> to look around. And then gradually, gradually, the whole impression of the space and the computer calculation of the structure in parallel in ACOM. And of course, the construction process, construction feasibilities, the size of the grids are in parallel. But the physical exper experience, the physical touch, is quite important. That such kind of a feedback is quite quite. Important. It's kind of a dialogue with me and my hand and the object and the computer and the, of course other teams. The, it was so exciting process. Yeah. yeah, and that leads also you know the question of the hand leads us also to your oh. your sketches. And, yeah. you know the <laughs> amazing book has been published. Uh, a few months ago, yeah. which has to do with what you call from the infinite dialogues of the brain, the yeah. eyes, the hand, the paper, the space. New architecture is born, and it's a yeah. facsimile of yeah. your amazing uh, sketches and drawings. And I'm interested to know more about this because, obviously, on the one hand, you know, Umberto Eco wrote this manifesto a couple of years ago where he says very, very that handwriting disappears. Uh -huh. um, and yet, at the same time, you know, in a recent conversation about art schools, Gustav Metzger says mm -hmm. he's immensely worried, you know, that drawing disappears, you yeah. know, in, in art schools. And even more so, obviously, you know, that's mm -hmm. the case in mm -hmm. architecture schools. And for you, yeah. this idea of hand drawing, of sketching, of doodling, one could also mm -hmm. call it, yeah. uh, has always been very important. You call it the endless process of trial and error. Can you tell yeah. us a little bit about this daily okay. practice? Of, it's a great book. Yeah. It's a bit, for me, it's a little bit, how to say, strange feeling because it's quite private <laughs> and quite messy. <laughs> because when I think about architecture, I use this and uh, I have to write something because only within my brain, I, it's impossible for me to, to think about. It's, my thinking is kind of a dialogue with my hand, and then some drawings coming to my eye, like uh, some different opinions from others, and then my brain could react to that. And the reaction is on the paper again, and then some different opinion is coming from this paper again to me. So the writings or making models is such a to making some other people or other opinions apart from mine, and then to like a, to make a nice mutual uh, dialogue to each other. And the, by these sketchbooks, such a dialogue is uh, anyway within me. But then with some team, Julia, the dialogue, then such a different point of view could make me aware what I'm thinking, or what I have been thinking. Because 
I'm, I'm not sure I know what I'm thinking. <laughs> Most of the thinking I'm thinking is almost, how to say, something, something not accessible for me. Small part coming to my hand and then through your opinion, through some really big reactions or through some slight notice, I gradually understand what is happening in my mind or in the sharing situations. So it was a really nice uh, talk with Julia yeah, about the forms and about the shapes, about the grids or how uh, I understand the nature, architecture. Yeah, Julia asked me again and again, <laughs> but it, that was, was a really nice opportunity for me to think about what I'm thinking. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, thank you, Sue. I mean, one of the things that's so extraordinary about the structure is that I think of it like drawing, because it's like a drawn line. And also, of course, the grid in the history of art plays this incredibly important, mm -hmm. um, has this incredibly important place for a number of different architects. Uh, I'm sorry, not architects, artists, uh, as well as architects. But Richard Rogers spoke very movingly about the pavilion and the, the purpose of the pavilion. And he talked about the way the pavilion touches the ground mm -hmm. and about the lightness of this pavilion and the way it touched the ground. Now, that's a very much, uh, he articulated something very much from the perspective of an architect. Mm -hmm. But it would, I'd love to hear you talk about that, that sense of, there's obviously weight here. I can't remember how many tons of steel yeah, we have, yeah. a really, really significant <laughs> amount. Yeah. But on the other hand, it feels light. And it's not only about the transparency, mm -hmm. it is about the way that engagement of the structure to the earth. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, it's uh, in the process of the, how to say, realization, we had uh, some nice moment, or many nice moment, to find out the nice solutions for the practical things as an important part of the design. The touching to the ground is one of the things. We, yeah, you can see that all the gravels is covering the, the legs. And you, you don't see some ugly details to, to fix to the ground. Because we have a concrete slabs under the gravel. And uh, of course, this pavilion should be dismantled after that. So it should be like a, a dismantled kind of, a, yeah, such an ability it should have. So we have uh, legs, of course, the fixed, screwed on the concrete, but we easily hide, and then we can easily dismantle. Such kind of a practical reason is the beginning, to use the gravels for the, for the ground. But then we understand, if you do such a thing, then the steel bar is just touching to the ground, not fixing the concrete, not with a, some kind of a bolt or something, just touching to the ground, it looks like. And it is, yeah, to creating such a light lightness or a really uh, extraordinary existing relation to the ground and uh, the structures. But of course, these gravel areas could work as a drainage, huge drainage areas as well, and uh, nice uh, intersections or nice in-between area between the green area, concrete area. If it is uh, just a concrete and green, it's too clear to divide inside and outside. So try to uh, find a one more uh, in-between area to make smooth, how to say, change in the ground textures. And such kind of things are, uh, and if another point is uh, not relating to the ground, touching to the ground, but the, the size of the grids. I, my original idea was just using the smaller grids because it, it was really formal, pure formal things I was thinking. So just the 40 centimeter grids I, I like to use. But then, from the practical construction uh, side, well, much easier to use, combine with the 80 centimeter grids, bigger grids. Then less steel amount and the less uh, welding point. And at the beginning, I was thinking it, it might be the, I was thinking about the risk to get it to the kind of a bad compromise. So we, with Julia, I think uh, with Julia and the David together <laughs> in Tokyo again, yeah. We just make a model, one to five uh, scale, so something like this. The combination of the two sides of the grid, big size, something like this, and the small size, to make a, the group of the 
20 cubes, something. And it looks really nice, fantastic, because it has a nice uh, diversity of the densities as it is. Some area really uh, porous, and some area really quite dense by the smaller grids. And it seems, of course, apart from such a pure, pure purity or pure aspects of the grids, but a little bit more free from such a too much straightforward grids. And I felt it's, it's quite nice. If you use such a same grids, it's the balance of the form and the formless is too, too formal. And I found it could have a nice balance, a nice ambiguity, positive ambiguities through that. So I, I was surprised and I got a, it was a nice moment for me to make it as more ideal and of course more practical. But not to compromise, but more, much, much better than, yeah. So such kind of a, how to say, discussion through the realizations, we didn't compromise, but to get the more inspirations, to get things more, to add more meanings to the original ideas, to make it more rich. It was a, a I think it was ideal process of the, of the architecture, I think. Yeah. Now, before we maybe move to some of your previous projects, because mm -hmm. we thought in this talk it would be good to also connect the pavilion to some of your, you know, uh, older projects. Maybe one last point about uh, the pavilion, and it really has to do a lot with what Niklas Marx's wonderful text, which you will all read in the catalogue, explores a lot, which has to do with the fact that we can read this pavilion, obviously, as a pavilion, we can read it as a house, we can read it as we experience it now, but we can always have this different scale experience, we can mm -hmm. have moments where all of a sudden uh, we think of metabolism, we mm -hmm. see uh, a city, uh, it's hovering, or at certain moments we can see it as a model. And that's mm -hmm. something, I mean, you mentioned also very early on, it was kind of interesting, because I remember in one of the earliest conversations, you talked about this idea that you were not interested in, you know, just doing a pavilion, you were interested mm -hmm. in the idea of the pavilion as a city, yeah. the city as a pavilion. Uh -huh. So can you talk a little bit about this? Uh, okay, yeah. I'm very interested in such a, how to say, in-between situations. Not only just a pavilion, or not only just a house, but uh, between house and uh, city, for example, or between house and furniture, for example, different scales could have a different meanings. And uh, not only just the independent scales, but the trans transition of the scales, or in between gradation of the scales, could have a nice, uh, amazing meanings. And uh, this is a pavilion, but uh, really open to the public, and sometimes so huge people is coming, but sometimes only one or two people is coming. And then, according to such a different situations, if, he, if, if it has a, such a gradation of the scales of the meanings, then if you are alone or only two, then it could be a really nice, cozy uh, corner. But if you, are, if you are together with the hundreds of people, it is a, like a plaza of the city areas. So I think uh, if you can make nice transition of the scales in one architecture, then it, even if it is a one architecture, but it could have a, the range of the between the urban situations and architecture situations, and furniture situations together. And such an in between feelings is quite, I think, a positive for future uh, living environment of us. I think. So we could imagine it as a model for future cities. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, I think yeah. So it could be expanding and uh, not just expanding as it is, but. Uh, the concept itself is expanding, yeah. I mean, one of the interesting things about this, as Hans Ulrich has said, is rel relating this uh, to, to other work. For example, the wooden house and something like... Um, okay, try to find, okay. House N.A., for example. Okay, for sure. Uh, of 2011. The wooden house is, is, is much earlier, one of your earliest works and um, of 2008. Um, but what seems to be a, a characteristic of your architecture is way, the way the body, mm -hmm. the way you choreograph, in a way, how uh -huh. the space is used, mm -hmm. um, which you have in this pavilion just as you have in those two projects, I, I would say all projects. Yeah. Um, and. One of the fascinating things for me is also how you're quite anarchic in how you think about architecture. But maybe just 
first of all. Anarchic. Anarchic. Anarchic, Anarchic is, well, let's say radical. Ah, radical, right, okay. Um, yeah. Radical, <clears throat> yeah. and I think of the way you cut the forms. <laughs> yeah. But maybe just to begin with, you could talk about mm -hmm. how you think of the way people use your spaces uh -huh. and the body in your yeah. spaces. Yeah. yeah, actually, yeah. every time I design some architecture, house, pavilion, or some other things, I like to redefine that thing, redefine a house, or redefine, or re-innovate the place for people to live. Not the house, but the place to live, or a place where we can have a nice uh, area in the park, something like that. So, like to redefine or re-innovate something. And uh, for that, I like to start from a really, really fundamental point. And one of the really fundamental points is, for me, is the relation between the human body and the space. Because anyway, the architecture space will be used by people. So starting from the relation between people's body or behaviors and the space, and then could, we could find a different viewpoint at the, as a beginning, and start again to reconstruct or redefining all the architecture elements, all the architecture uh, definitions. So I think uh, the, such a starting from the human behaviors is a really, really important starting point to make the radical or to make something new. And uh, yeah, in this case, yeah, we started from the side of the grids, the 40 centimeters. So sometimes it could be getting uh, like a wall. So, but finally there is no wall. Well, there is no roof, but the, all the elements are, how to say, mixing together to, we, we call something different. We don't have name yet, <laughs> but uh, we have something, some area. So, yeah, I, I like to do such a redefining, and not just redefining, but the recreate the comfortableness of the, of the space. So, to starting from such a basic behavior of the people, then we could find new definitions or new space of the comfortable, I understand, yeah. So that, that is a very important point, and uh, yeah, I think uh, it's... And of course, another really important fundamental starting point is the nature and architecture. It is, again, different viewpoint, but uh, quite fundamental things. So I, I think in this project, such kind of a two really important starting points meet together in one point and then realize in a really, really magical way, I understand. Now to talk about the earlier projects, maybe we can try to look at some <laughs> images. <Okay. laughs> uh, now one of the things I think, we don't have images of the very early work, but still yeah. maybe just a few words about it, because your Children's Center for Psychiatric Rehabilitation, yeah. it's very unusual for a young architect, because usually in Japan an architect starts by designing a small private house, at least most of the Japanese architects I've met, you know, that's always been the point of departure, but in your case it was actually from the very beginning a house which was also a city because you designed the structure um, which was both. It was a combination of house and city. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of interesting because you're here yeah. in a pavilion which is a house and a city. You know, a lot. I think it's yeah. interesting. It's the same thing in, in, in our world, the, the, you know, the art world, that basically very often in the first work of an artist you have already a lot of the later work. Yeah. So maybe that's why it's good to start there. Okay. Yeah. Actually, I started my career to design. Uh, medical <laughs> facilities for my father <laughs> because in the early days I didn't have any project so I just uh, make uh, two buildings for my father and uh, my father is a mental doctor the doctor for the mental disease and uh, this is this project the children's center is for my uh, father's friends and again for the medical uh, facilities and uh, that was a bit unusual for younger architects in Japan to start such a rather not different from a private house. Usually, younger generation starts from the private house, my par your parents or friends or something. But I just get the project to design such a medical facilities. And at the beginning, I didn't know how to understand such a situations. The private house I did in school, so it's a bit easier to understand to how to do it. But the medical facilities, no ideas to do that. And then, of course, I talked with my father, 
And then gradually I understand the hospital is not the hospital. It's the place for people to stay a bit longer. And the private area, of course, uh, inquire, required, but the more social area required. So it is like a city, small city, or a small society. So I understand it's an it's a opportunity to design the private house, the more between private and public, and the social plaza, and uh, su such kind of a between, or including city and house and everything. So then I thought it's quite precious opportunity to, to think about that, to think about such a relationship, so in between uh, situations. And the first one, I'm sorry, I didn't have, I don't have an image, but the first project is uh, just uh, the workspace for the patients, daily work, the wooden craft ship or such a things. So only one space and with an office for staffs and entrance or something like that. So it's quite simple uh, programs. But I thought if the hospital is such a, a private social uh, space, it's only such a simple program it could be nicely redefined. And then finally I made just a ring, no one space, but the one room, but the, but the ring. And then the intention is if you make the kind of a bagel, <laughs> like a bagel, inside of a bagel, like this, and if, if you make some, such a ring space, if you are standing in the one point, or sitting in the one point, there must be one space. Uh, you can be hidden from behind. I mean, all the, not all the space visible. Uh, one space is necessarily, necessarily uh, hidden or privately separated. So more private, I, mean, I was, sorry, I was thinking about, it's one space shared by everybody, but you could have a point, you can hide in, you can escape from others. And it's endless, so you could find different point to be hiding, hide it in, from others, or you could easily join to the others. So it is a really simple uh, system to, to divide privacy and public in a continuous way. That is the first project. It's a kind of a really simple uh, labyrinth. <laughs> you could be hidden or you could be appearing, coming and uh, go away and coming out. And then this children's center is, is a more like a, the model of the, the small city. It's a I hope you could see. It's a group of the cubes, a group of the, the buildings. And the between space is a more public space. It's a living space, a dining space, or a corridor. And then it is a one facility, one uh, medical facility, but it is a group of the houses for children. And then the between area is more public pathway or plaza of the city. So it is a representation of the such a more direct representation of the, such a sit, between city and house, privacy, public, uh, plaza things. But through these kind of a medical project, I get an idea of such a integration of the public, private, and the social, uh, privacy, and house and city, such an in-between concept. Maybe you can move on then to the wooden house, because Julia asked you already about that. I don't know if we have images of that. Oh yes, I hope. You could see somehow, yes, this wooden house. Okay. Yep. Do you want to talk a little bit about it? Okay, this wooden house is more relating to the, yeah, the point Julia was talking about, some human behaviors and uh, space. And again, in here, I was thinking about, yeah, in the medical facilities, I was thinking about something between the architecture and the urban situations. But in here, I was thinking about something between furniture and the architecture. It is usually we have a architecture space and put the furniture on it. So it's a, it has a really clear hierarchy uh, between two of them. But then I try to uh, make a nice gradation from the architecture scales to the furniture scales transitions to make less hierarchies between two of them and to redefine the furniture, what it is, and uh, redefine what, it, what is architecture. 
So in this case, the wooden block is stuck up to create the whole cave-like space, but on each level, so you could find some unexpected uh, steps or areas or hidden spaces. So the whole space are like a furniture, but the whole space is uh, like a architecture. And one of the, yeah, Julia, please. Now one of the things which came to my mind is you know the sort of spatial relativity because I remember when you came to the Gary Pavilion uh -huh. and it was yeah. almost like a very touching <laughs> moment because there was this many-dimensional wooden house projected into Gary's pavilion. It yeah. became like a labyrinth. <laughs> yeah. And you talked about Einstein oh, and yeah. spatial relativity and mm -hmm. the inspiration you had from science. Yeah. And obviously here we are also in an environment of spatial relativity, you mm -hmm. know, and that's mm -hmm. kind of interesting because already a lot of things are in this wooden house. I mean, it's akin uh, to a nebulous landscape, as you told us at the time, yeah. it has a spatial relativity, mm -hmm. um, and it has also this thing that it's both very, very basic, very primitive, yet also yeah. very new. Can mm -hmm. you talk a little bit about these aspects? Okay, yeah, Einstein is a. Uh, of course, I before I like to do architecture, I was a big fan of Einstein, and of course, I am still a big fan of Einstein because I was fascinated by his way to re-understand the whole world by a really simple way. And uh, of course, the thinking about the relativity, I try to find uh, possibilities to redefine architecture by relativity. And in this wooden house or in this space also, usually we have a not relative strong floor for architecture. And then the hierarchy is quite uh, strong. But uh, thinking about the relativities, we have sometimes floor could be the some tables in you know, a different levels i can i can show you some diagram okay mm -hmm. i hope you to see it has a uh, different levels and then sometimes tables could be for one people tables but for another people it's a uh, seatings or uh, the floors or the just the ceilings so from the different viewpoint the space could have a different meanings that is the the ideas of the get an inspiration from the einstein's relativities if you have a different viewpoint, if you have a different situation, the whole meanings of the space is different. That is, I think, a really rich meaning of the architecture. Because if, he, if one space has only one meaning, it's a bit pity. But if one space could have a different meanings according to the different situations, then it could be in the place to place different meanings or this, according to the seasons, according to the, the times. If, if it is... If, if it, it could have a different meanings. It is quite rich and endless uh, sequence of the uh, emerging uh, space, I think. So at the time I was thinking about such a richness of the space or a new definition of architecture, because I was thinking about the beautiful contrast between the functionalism or architecture for function and the new uh, relative meanings of architecture. Architecture for functions or functional architecture, the space has a function. So a space has a one meaning, proper way to use it. But uh, our usual life is quite different from such a definition of functions. Sometimes we eat something in the kitchen or our bedrooms or some things or lying on the uh, terrace, something like that. So our natural behaviors is more uh, like a, such a relative uh, choice of the meanings. So I try to make it more suitable for our natural uh, life and make it, uh, try to make it. Because there, there are um, a number of projects that you've done in Tokyo, uh, which are apartments, uh, they're houses, the house NA, house yeah. N. And particularly what fascinates me um, of, of your what I would call your, your housing for private clients mm -hmm. is the Tokyo Apartments. Yeah, yeah. And the reason I'm so fascinated by this is because it seems to me that you engage with the taboos of architecture. Mm -hmm. In other words, um, where a floor cuts a window or yeah. a, um, a sink cuts a window. <laughs> yeah. It's a really things that are, would make you feel so make me feel so uneasy in yeah. other situations and this very and this is what I call uh, this is when I use the word anarchic because <laughs> it's taking on some of the taboos in the most incredibly interesting way so could you 
Brad, could you tell us more about that um, yeah. approach? Okay, yeah, you could see that this is an image of the Tokyo apartment close up, and you could see this uh, diagonal structure is going across the window. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, actually, in this project, I was thinking about such kind of a strange, unexpected uh, juxtaposition of the things. Because, in, for example, in the forest, we have such a, uh, how to say, nice, unexpected situations happening. And uh, if we design architecture in a proper way, everything is uh, really on, in control and nicely designed. It is only one intention, I'm afraid. And, but the, in the forest or in the city of Tokyo, for example, it has a many different kinds of intentions are coming together. Sometimes one is over something and one is uh, next to next adjacency. And then it is creating some kind of a richness of experience. It is relating to the not designing architecture as a function. It's more like uh, designing architecture as a, the richness of the uh, experience. And then in this case, the structure itself requires these diagonal lines. But as, an, uh, yeah, as your life, you like to have a window. So we just uh, overlay two re different requirements and uh, let it do that. <laughs> and then I, I was expecting such kind of a nice uh, adjacency or unexpected uh, combinations together could be of course, this is a super artificial frame, super artificial shapes, but could have a nice aspects of the nature, I was thinking, or a forest, uh, I was expecting. So, in this project, it is, looks like a, just a design or playful design of the, the architecture, but uh, behind that, I have a continuous concept between nature and architecture or unexpected uh, or a complex order and uh, the simple, simple architecture order. Now this richness, uh, you call it a rich place, I mean obviously in the context of the Tokyo apartment, I'm Swiss so it reminded me of yeah. the mountains. <laughs> yeah. There's a kind of a, oh, it's yeah. like Tokyo mountain, <laughs> oh, yeah, there's yeah. a kind of a mountains moment. Yeah. But you, you create these riches in many different ways and, and uh, I mean the, in the end house for example, um, it's more like a matrushka thing. There is a shell within the shell. There mm -hmm. is a house within yeah. the house within the house. Yeah. There is a gradation, and you said the kind of you know the simple wall mm -hmm. is kind of too simple. Can you talk a little bit about that richness? Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, yes. Before that, this Tokyo apartment. Yeah. We at the beginning we are thinking about yeah. Actually, the mountain like thing, three dimensional pathway. Yeah. We have in Tokyo many many pathway, winding pathways. So try to create three-dimensional pathway to uh, walking up like uh, artificial mountains. So yeah, that is the, the, exactly the, that, the original idea. And for the house M, it is uh, the house box in box in box, three box, and it's, uh, I think it's a rather famous project, so some of you, I hope, could know it. But uh, yeah, this is a, uh, and uh, it is uh, cre to create in-between space. Box and box and box, but between box and box, sometimes outside, sometimes half inside, and the outside area we, we have a trees, so it is a nice mixture of the outside inside like that. But uh, the richness of this is we have a in box and box and box. We have a many many openings on each box. So the layering of the the openings, layering of the different layers of the openings could create the different sunlight, like, just like these uh, structures. Some area really densely shaded and some area really open and according to the direction of the sun, according to the sun, time, the whole impression is changing. And uh, the house N done in, has been done in five years ago. It's the, the more, much more simple way to make such a uh, really complex in, uh, experience of their nature or surroundings. And you could see how the sky is changing and how the sunlight is changing uh, through, through such an opening. So I think uh, it is one very, very uh, simple description is we just create the, the compl complex frames to see nature or to see surroundings. The main experience of the house is not done by the 
structure, but mainly done by the changing nature surroundings. But such kind of changing natures are created by the box and box and box form frames. So it is kind of a the object, architecture object, are going behind, and the natures or the impression of the surroundings is coming in front. It's a it's an amazing uh, experience. Now I'd like to ask any of you if you would like if you have any questions to Sue before we ah here we go. Thank you. Whether you think there are any other sort of opportunities for spontaneous or maybe even accidental in, in, interaction with the building? Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm very, very looking forward to how the, the music composer could react to, will react to this space. Because in a sense, it's really, really like a, like a music or like a the flow of the, the sound or something like air, the vibration of the air, maybe. And uh, of course, I'm simply really looking forward to see how children is going to react I saw in this uh, previous days, I saw some of the children really, really nicely play with that. Or dogs is <laughs> going under the pathway, so it's a different dimension of the, the pavilions. And uh, possibly the kind of a, such a performance directly reacting to the space could be nice. And uh, you, you could have more idea. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we hope yeah. you can all come back for this. You'll see on our website the park lights, and the park uh -huh. that we refer to is actually the uh, English composer Russell Haswell. You know, we'll present and introduce and collaborate. He's a Japanese composer, mm -hmm. Yasuna Otone, and uh, we hope you can all come. Well, one of the things that occurs to me is the the way you you did the drawing that I've seen of a musical score where mm -hmm. you separate uh -huh. the actual score itself and the notes. Yeah and then use it as a kind of structure, just like you would a grid without the cross. Mm -hmm. And so um, I'm, I feel this incredible link between all these works. Yeah. So that idea of playing the, this building uh, or using this building as a score mm -hmm. is already evident uh, in that much yeah. earlier incarnation yeah. of yours. Oh, yeah, yeah. Sorry, uh, it's, it's really pity. I don't have uh, such an image, but it is a... Uh, just a classical back, back score without lines. Yeah, usually we have a line on the score, but uh, only uh, the notes. Oh, oh yes, yes. The notes are remaining and they're removing all the scores. And uh, it was done about 10 years ago uh, when I was uh, sitting in the, the restroom. I got an inspiration. <laughs> and then it is very important because uh, all the notes has a nice mutual relationships and uh, yeah it seems like a chaos but at the same time it has some kind of a form independent from the really strong lines forms but it has a different kinds of organic forms is appearing so for me it's a big inspiration to design uh, something from the really strong order to the more uh, soft but order and can you tell us because I remember when we met for the first time, it was in this dinner in Tokyo and Yukon yeah. had introduced us yeah. and you showed us this book, The Primitive Future, and I was extremely stunned because it's a book of, it's a manifesto, it's a text, it's an architecture book, yeah. and in the middle of it there are these mysterious two pages, <laughs> Aria with different changes, it's Johann yeah. Sebastian Bach, and then Aria with different changes, and it's basically, can you explain it to us more? <laughs> okay. Okay, yeah. It's a, this is a chapter two. The note without staves, it's a note without lines, and the new geometry. And uh, this, this, just a line, no, no notes, just a line. And uh, we have a caption, Miss, Miss van der Rohe. So it is a kind of a nothing, just a, just a grid, or just an just a underlying space. And this, the opposite. Notes, every note, but no lines. And it is caption question mark. <laughs> I didn't know what it is at the time and uh, should be updated. Uh, but uh, yes, the Mies is a 
yeah, as you know, space without anything, just a, just a space. It's, space is continuous or spreading background our life. So our life, any kinds of our life is on it. But the myths define the whole structure of our world. So I try to do something opposite or something different. So the space is not anymore like a myth defined. Our space is emerging in the relationship between each different nodes. So like something like this. Of course, we have a background, but the, the meanings of this grid is different according to how you react to this space or how do you communicate to each other in persons or how you are alone or how you are together. So the me meanings of the space in me is predefined. But I try to say the meanings of the space is not predefined but could be emerged in a different way according to our uh, reactions or our communications to the space or to each other. So that is the, the meanings of this. And uh, yeah, it was... <laughs> A bit strange idea, so I try to erase all the line by Photoshop <laughs> to make it. I remember. Can I see that? Yeah. It's so this, great because I always wanted to ask you this, and we always <laughs> forgot. I was so curious. And then the first cousin of this, um, the yeah. two pages that Sue's just shown you, is this, which is also a yeah. kind of uh, the musical notation without, yeah. obviously without the notes, but also a different kind of form. But I never thought about the musical score, both the score with the notes as being a kind of grid. Mm -hmm. It's a grid with a pom-pom. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but um, now I think we've probably got time for two more questions. So who would like to ask something, if there's anybody? Yes, please, could you have the microphone here? Good afternoon. Thank you for Hello. your talk. And you. I have a question for three of you. And I want to know about the relativity between this pavilion and the original structure behind it. Mm -hmm. And I, because you mentioned about Einstein and relativity, and also I think um, as curator, the director and co-director has some kind of intention to put this pavilion every summer in front of your original structure. So could you talk more about it? Uh, okay, yeah, of course it's a big challenge because every, in this uh, 13 years, every big name did the various different contrasts, beautiful contrasts or beautiful uh, connections of these original buildings and the pavilions. So, at, yeah, at the beginning I had no idea, but the, when the Greek idea came, it is something so different from the brick buildings. It is uh, almost opposite. Brick, solid things, and the pole that's almost made by air or on, on the space. It's, so the form of this could have a nice, beautiful contrast, I thought. And then if you are maybe in front of the street, just in front of these buildings, you could see the whole shape of the pavilion. It's somehow like this, like a, a funny creature. But then the shape of the serpentine buildings on the sharp top and the whole soft shape of this uh, pavilions are slightly corresponding, not too much uh, relating, but slightly corresponding. So softly covering the original buildings from that direction and hiding but the silhouette could be seen. So such kind of a nice, uh, how to say, translucencies could, I, I was thinking about. And uh, one more point. I found out a week ago that the nice communication with the window frames of these buildings and these frames yeah. almost the same. So <laughs> yeah, actually, the, my, I was staying in the hotel there west, so I walked from that direction, and then the first white things with grid, and I thought, oh wow, that's the pavilion, and then I found out this is just a window frame. <laughs> <laughs> and then I found out, wow, I was <laughs> influenced by this, yeah, starting point was this window frame. Finally, it's emerging to the different geometries. So that's the, that's the, the relationship. Yeah. I think one of the things that's so 
notable about this pavilion compared to perhaps some in other years is the transparency um, of the view onto the building, our building, and also the view onto the park. And that kind of meshing of both a built structure, the Sapphine Gallery, and nature is absolutely key. I mean, when Sue talks about his work, um, nature and architecture are really intertwined and in that way perhaps this context is an ideal one for, for you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, the reason why we, um, we, have, uh, uh, got, uh, we have devised this commission, the start of it wasn't a, a conscious decision to do a pavilion every year, to commission a pavilion every year. It was something that grew organically, uh, uh, in the best possible way, from a project we did in 2000 when we invited Zaha Hadid to design a pavilion. And um, because of our particular situation being in the Royal Park, we were able for it to stay not just for two nights, which was the intention, but for a much longer period. It's our way of exhibiting architecture, I think, for those of you who know the project well, it will, you will know and heard us say before that it's not about an exhibition of drawings and models and, and photographs. It is a commission and the opportunity for the public to experience a space by an architect that we commission, or the architect we commission, so that people can really understand it. And the other thing which is important to say is that we do not commission British architects uh, on the premise that their work will be seen in this country. So it's only for architects whose work uh, has, not been, uh, has, has not been seen in this country. In other words, they have no building. I think the thing about the Serpentine is that we are a very small building and we have to use every inch of it very wisely. And once we had the opportunity to lose this lawn, it became, it doubled our size. It's our new wing every year and it's our exhibition of architecture. It's, it's like having um, an ex exhibition galleries for architecture, and that's really how, it, how it's played out. That's exciting because it provides routine. Routine is the enemy. It always has, you know, leads to a frozen situation, and this idea that there is a new wing every year and the content has to be redefined, the form has to be redefined, the whole you know, situation has to be redefined, keeps it incredibly dynamic. It avoids that, you know, becomes a frozen institutional routine. It's always a new beginning, it's a new departure. And we must maybe also mention that this year for the first time, it's actually not only the pavilion and the serpentine, but it's also rock on top of another rock. You know, we've got a three, we've got a third element here. It's an outdoor sculpture uh, by um, Peter Fischley and David Weiss, which for those of you who haven't seen it, you can see mm -hmm. afterwards just next to the gallery, these two enormous rocks. It's uh, equilibrium, referring to the early equilibrium photographs of Fischley Weiss of the 80s, and it's obviously very interesting in relation to Sue, because one of the things we haven't spoken about, Sue, are your, you know, boxes on top of another box, uh -huh. the house on top of another house. Yeah. So we have, you know, the house before house, or we have the NA house, the kind of sequences of stacked boxes. Mm -hmm. So the rock on top of another yeah. rock actually does resonate <laughs> with your work. Yeah. Perfectly. Any more, one more question. Yes, please. Could we get the microphone up there? Thank you. Uh, so, thanks very much for your talk. Um, I have a, actually have a question for the, the Serpentine Gallery people. He, so is talking about how he wants to have human behavior as a starting point for maybe something radical. And he looks at how people can use a space in their own way, you know, to really, you know, be free. And it's kind of an invitation in a way. And I think people feel invited by it and they climb on it and they maybe children were already hanging from it, etc. At the same time, people are chased off the lawn, right? There's lots of, you know, you can't go on the grass. I mean, how, how does this philosophy of so actually influences your own uh, attitude in this? institution. I, I can help you very easily with this. Um, if you walk on grass that is freshly laid, uh, it, it gets ruined. And we only have the money to turf the lawn once. So if we don't take care of the grass, which is a living thing, it will get ruined and die. And that's a pity. It's a pity for the grass. 
And it's also a pity for the certain time because it means that we then are in problems about replacing it. And the context of Sue's pavilion is not this beautiful structure resting lightly on a, on a green lawn in a park which is all green. It's resting on possibly a muddy field which is not flat and we're embarrassed. So the practicalities of doing these projects are and it's a very, very good question, and it's not often that I'm, uh, or we are in a position to be able to answer it fully. So prepare yourselves, ladies and gentlemen, for a very long <laughs> talk on the subject. Because we have, if people go into the building, there is a convention about how they use it. You know, they might not use the loos very nicely, but if they're in the galleries and they start manhandling works of art, you know, probably they know that's not the right thing to do. And somebody will come over and say, you know what, that's not so great, please stop it. If it's a structure like this, people use it, and this is the wonderful part, as if it's their own home, and we want that. But we also have, sitting on file, a risk report that tells us how this structure can be used. And it's not quite, it doesn't align with probably how you'd like to use it, how the children would like to use it, and indeed how Sue would like it to be used. But we have a weight sitting on our head saying, if you don't look after it in this way, you are going to, I mean, obviously not you, we are going to be in big trouble. And the big trouble and the form that big trouble takes, just to play it out since I have got your total attention, um, is in the most extreme sense we end up in court, and in the not extreme sense, uh, we have people who are unhappy. So it is a very, very good question. And it's, um, it's one that we actually spend a lot of time discussing. And of course, it's a balance. And we aim to get that balance right. Sometimes we may err on the side of being a little bit too rigorous. But it's always with the best intention and always with the, with the responsibility of the visitor or the, the user uh, in mind. And as Julia says, you know, there are parameters. It's like if you look at Olympian poetry, you know, it happens within parameters and within those there is a maximum of freedom, right? So basically, you know, there are the laws, there is health and safety, but within those laws, you know, the pavilion gives an extraordinary freedom of use. I mean, it is extraordinary. We were here this morning, you know, and I actually met Sue very early this morning around 7.38 and, yeah. you know, there were already first people here and it was an amazing situation because you had, on the one hand, the joggers, you know, uh, were running through the pavilion. You had already yeah. first visit of reading the newspaper. <laughs> you know, people brought their coffee. Um, and so, in, in some kind of way, and that goes on all day long, you know, that there are many, many different uses, even if it's not possible, for example, to climb body structure. There are so many other things you can do here, and every year there are so many things, you know, people actually invent with the pavilion. You know, the year we had uh, Olaf Elias and Katie Dawson, the ramp, you know, became a, a jogging ramp, you know, with Frank Gehry, it was a stretching situation. There's lots of unexpected use, and it goes all day long. You know, people have free meetings. This is not the place where you have to consume. You know, in our cities today, in the 21st century, there are not that many spaces where you actually not, you know, obviously uh, can have a coffee, you can eat, but you're not obliged. You know, everybody, you know, comes and asks you to have to consume. It's a completely free zone. It's architecture for all. You don't have to pay admission. It's free admission. It goes into the evening. Then very often in the evening, there are screenings. You know, we only mention the music part. It becomes a cinema, an open-air cinema. You know, it becomes a lecture hall, an agora, a, a platform. It becomes a place for marathons. So, you know, we do believe that there is a lot of freedom and a real multitude of use. And it's probably, if you think about the use, one of the densest used structures in London, you know, throughout the summer, because it just never stops. So, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, thank you very, very, very much for coming. But before we need to, before you clap, I want to celebrate Sue, his team, and to thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.